here. Um, on behalf of the Health Sciences Interest Group, my name is uh, John Siegel. I'm the coordinator of information literacy uh, at the University of South Carolina Upstate. And I'm also the incoming convener for the Health Sciences uh, Interest Group. So just um, a few things. We're, again, we're glad you're here. There are over um, 150 people, 175 people here, and over 400 people had signed up. Um, we will have four presenters today. Um, what we're going to do is um, ask that if you have questions for the presenters, um, you please type them into the chat box. There will be time for us to ask questions at the end. They'll be compiled um, and saved for the end. And a, um, the session will be recorded and a link will be sent out. Um, just a few things before I introduce our presenters. Um, the Health Sciences Interest Group um, is part of ACRL and the group uh, is does a lot of networking and other events um, such as this. We really enjoy sharing information and invite uh, people from different sized libraries who have an interest who are involved in academic health sciences to participate. We do have two resources that I wanna bring your attention to. One is the uh, email list, which anyone can join. Um, you don't have to be an ACRL member. Um, that's pretty active. And we also have a LibGuide, which has a bunch of resources. The links are here, uh, and I will also put them in the chat box. So uh, I'd like to give a special shout out to several people. Uh, first of all, the amazing Aloha Sharp, who has been very patient with me at ACRL as we've set this up. Maribeth Slobodnik, who's the current HSIG convener and then our various HSIG programming subcommittee members with a special call out to Shannon Johnson, who is the brainchild between a B for this webinar, and she's also nice enough to compile um, questions for us. So without further ado, I'm going to tell you who our presenters will be. Each presenter um, will have 15 minutes um, to present, and we've got presenters from a wide variety of institutions. First will be um, on our list is Nancy Adams and Marie Sorelli from Penn State University College of Medicine. We have Virginia DeSuki from West Virginia University, Margaret Vugren from Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. And last but not least, we have Annie Zeidman Karpinski from the University of Oregon. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Nancy and Marie, so we can hear their exciting presentation. Nancy and Marie, all yours. Okay, we're just going to share our screen here. Hi, my name is Nancy Adams. Um, I am a librarian here at Harold Health Sciences Library, Librarian for Education and Instruction, and also Assistant Dean in the first two years of the medical curriculum. And I'm Marie Sorelli. I'm the Collection Access Librarian here. One moment, we're going to see. There oh, there go. they are, there they are. Okay, um, so just to start out with, uh, just a little bit about who we are here at Penn State College of Medicine. We have about 150 medical students per class, and we have a competency-based curriculum. And one of the competencies that the students have to meet before graduation is the one I put on the slide here, which is to identify one's own knowledge gaps as they emerge in patient care activities, formulate an appropriate question to address the gap, utilize clinical informatics to locate a praise, and assimilate evidence to inform patient care. So we saw a definite opportunity for the library to be involved in helping students attain this competency. And um, we believe that teaching them how to do a good literature search and looking at the primary literature from the get-go is one of the things that was really gonna help them um, achieve this. Um, our students also participate in a lot of problem-based learning sessions, which involve a significant amount of self-directed learning um, so this is just a great opportunity for us to kind of get in there 
um, and help them. So our we've been teaching uh, medical students how to use PubMed for a number of years, and the assignment that we're going to describe to you evolved over the years. It's gone from everywhere. It's been at different points in the first year. We used to teach people the first day of orientation how to search PubMed. That was not effective at all because it was just an overwhelming amount of information on day one of medical school. We added a required assignment, which we still have. It used to be a very kind of worksheet type fill in the blank assignment that was um, done in person with an in-person instruction session with a librarian. But we've now moved to an online module. It's 100% online with videos and a required assignment. It is now much more open-ended and learner-centered. So the reason that we made all of these changes is um, uh, for various reasons. One of them, that second bullet, is just lack of time. We went to an online module when um, several years ago the, the curriculum in the first year of medical school was compressed. So they, they kind of crunched it down quite a bit and we um, did, no longer had in-class time. But we feel that the online um, module is actually better and students can do it at their own pace. It is still required. We wanted the um, teaching of PubMed to be very relevant. As I said, we used to teach them how to search PubMed on day one of their orientation. They didn't need to use it that day. They didn't need to use it for weeks. It just was not relevant at the time. And we've made it much more relevant because we tie the assignment to, we tie our own PubMed assignment to a specific case during that week of their problem-based learning session. They have um, a specific case that we, that we tie it to. Um, it's very learner-centered, so um, the, the way that we redesign the assignment is to have them ask their own question. Instead of us telling them what to search, they come up with what they want to search and then kind of show that, they, that they're using all the principles we teach them in the videos. And finally, our institution was really focusing, started focusing a lot on critical thinking just like many other medical schools have. Um, they, we want our students to really um, become better critical thinkers all through the four years of medical school. So there was no aspect of critical thinking before in our assignment. So what we've done now is they have to pose their own questions, use PubMed to search to find an article that answers it, and then read the article and critically analyze it to um, show how it does or does not answer their original question. Just going a little more in depth with what um, Nancy was saying about the assignments that uh, we developed. These were the specific learning objectives that we had. Um, the students, we needed them to formulate a question that was relevant to a clinical vignette that they were reading in one of their problem-based learning sessions. Then they needed to construct a PubMed search statement using mesh terms, keywords, Boolean operators um, to combine those terms, use filters, obtain full text through our library website and analyze a published article for its relevance to answering their question. Okay. Um, so as mentioned, we delivered our content via videos that we posted on YouTube, and we broke the content into five parts. The first one you'll see is why is PubMed part of the medical curriculum? And this just kind of stresses that at this point in their educational career, they need to start using the professional tools of their field and why this is going to be something that they really need to learn how to do. The second video was uh, searching PubMed like an expert searching with keywords. And so we thought this was a really important video in this series to, to go through the searching with keywords even before we got to the mesh terms, because a lot of this video talks about the things you need to do before you even go and search in a database. So taking your topic, breaking it into logical pieces um, and all of its component parts, and then kind of forming your search strategy ahead of time. So this is really um, an important part of instruction, database instruction that's frequently missed. Because um, I think we all get really excited to show them the MeSH terms and how great it is and how wonderful it's going to make their life if they can learn how to use subject headings. But if they can't break their topic apart 
into logical pieces to even begin the search, using mesh terms is really not going to be much of a help to them. So this um, is a very important video that we have. Then, of course, we do talk about using the mesh terms. Uh, the third video is uh, combining using our AND and OR Boolean operators and also uh, the highly related articles feature. And then finally, we talk about using filters and then how to get to the full text through our library holdings. So here's a screenshot of um, our assignment. What they do for this assignment is all posted in our course management system. Um, none of it is in person. It's all completely online. So first of all, we ask them to read a case, which is just a very small paragraph describing a muscular dystrophy, um, a patient with muscular dystrophy and their symptoms. Um, they, we always work with the clinicians to actually write this. We do not write it ourselves, but we have some great partners who we work with. They then formulate a question, any kind of a question that, that they're curious about after reading this case vignette. It might be a basic science question. It might be a question about the symptoms. It might even be a question about how you would communicate um, with the parents of a, a patient with muscular dystrophy or um, insurance, how insurance covers muscular dystrophy, anything any one of those kind of aspects. They then watch the five videos, and then they do their search using the skills that they learn in the five videos. After that, we ask them to give us the search statement that they use to successfully find the videos, and we do um, request that it have at least one mesh term in it. We have a rubric that we're going to show you for how we grade those. Um, and then they find a full text article. We also make sure that the article that they found is truly full text because we found that sometimes students don't, don't understand you know, how to find the full text article. And then they have to tell us, the last part of the assignment is they have to write and tell us how um, the article was or was not relevant to their original question. So it's okay if they find an article that's not relevant, um, but they have to tell us why. So that's where the critical thinking comes in. This is, again, a required um, activity, and it's graded by several of the librarians here in uh, Herald Health Sciences Library. So um, this is the rubric that we actually developed. Um, so in developing this rubric, we kind of thought about the tasks that the students had to do and then what was going to be important for them to accomplish um, those tasks. We, uh, I think, went through a couple iterations of this, bounced it off some other librarians here as well um, before we decided to go with this. And even with that, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit later, we still came up with some changes that we want to make going forward in this new year. But to kind of go over it really quick, um, the first thing they had to do was the question. So they had to have a question that was relevant to the case and why answering it would be important to their understanding of the case. They also had to express the question in search terms, so break it apart. Um, no superfluous search terms could be used, and each important concept, they had to express it. Mesh, they had to use at least one mesh term, so they could use a combination of mesh and keywords, and if a Boolean operator was needed, it had to be used appropriately. So sometimes it Depending on the question, it was necessary for them to use them. Sometimes it wasn't. Filters and full text, they did have to use at least one filter appropriately. And they had to identify an article that had full text availability through our library. So um, we have the little link out button um, in PubMed that they have to use. And then finally, they have to justify why they picked their article, why it was, what about it was appropriate to answer the question. Um, what about it was not really relevant to their, their understanding. So what we found was students struggled the most with um, the mesh. That was the, the number one thing they had a hard time with. The things they did best at was the question and the relevance part, which makes a lot of sense. That's what they're interested in. You know, mesh is very more like the librarian stuff that we're interested in. Um, and we did notice that the the way the old assignment was, which was much more cookbooky, um, not so much critical thinking, some still struggled with the mesh, but not as much as they did with this assignment. So before it was more given to them. Here's the question, here's the topic, what are the mesh terms for this? It was really 
kind of spoon fed to them. But in real life, that's never how they're actually going to be searching for information. It's never going to be spoon fed to them in that way. So this was much more true to what they'll be encountering. Um, so it was interesting to see how in this new type of scenario, they really struggled with using the MeSH terms. And we did give them this rubric ahead of time. It's just kind of good educational practice to let them know how they're going to be graded. And even with that, some of them still um, still struggled. But. Here is an example of a really um, exemplary uh, submission that we received. So you can see um, that they wrote a very detailed question about the role of dystrophin in muscular strength. Um, they actually um, wrote a nice pinpointed to succinct search statement and used um, a, an appropriate filter. They didn't have any superfluous terms and you could see from the, uh, from the question that they might have put a whole bunch of terms in there, but we thought it was a very good search statement. And then um, the, the, you have the title of the article they selected and the description of the relevance, which actually kind of went on and on. These students really wanted to, I, I think, show us how they were critically thinking and really read those articles in a very closely to describe what they learned from them. Okay, so um, I mentioned with the rubric, we saw some things we wanted to change going forward. The number one thing was we realized the way we had it graded, students could use absolutely no mesh, or if they did use mesh, use it incorrectly and still pass. So even though the other parts of um, the assignment are very important as well, we really wanted to stress them learning how to use mesh. And unfortunately, the way we had it graded made it so they could kind of get away with that. Um, so it's just, you know, we think it's a good basic concept for them to learn when searching a database because it's a way that they can quickly locate articles that are relevant. And um, it's relevant to many other databases as well. So we want to kind of make sure that we bring that point home and not make it so they can just throw in some keywords and get away with it. And finally, we wanted to um, tell you that you can feel free to use our videos. There are five of them. You see the titles here. And they're all available on YouTube. If you search Penn State Hershey Harrell Health Sciences Library, you will get to our video um, the whole channel. And you can see they all start with the words searching PubMed like an expert. Thank you, we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks Nancy and Marie. So next up we have Virginia DeSuki from West Virginia University. So, Virginia? And just a note for the presenters, if you can please in PowerPoint, make sure your screens um, to help people see them are, are full screen, We um, that'd be great. Okay, can you hear me now? Did you hear me before? Okay, um, let me go back. Okay. And I don't know if you heard my my introduction, but I was saying that I'm uh, at West Virginia University at the Health Science Library, and I've been teaching PubMed for a while. And I normally would do uh, the PubMed class in a lecture style class, and uh, just about a few months ago, I took a library juice. Uh, class on active learning strategies so that was it was what really got me started on changing the way I teach PubMed now I use a more um, active learning approach and I have uh, also incorporated a little bit of the flipped class approach um, So I still include a little bit of lecture with that also, but it, it's shorter. So I think it's 
I think it makes it more interesting for the students. And if you're not familiar with the flipped classroom concept, it's a blended learning and it um, has the instruction delivered often online or uh, they can do part of it um, at home. They can do part of the, the um, work at home and then come in and it also may include online lectures, online discussion, which they do outside of class, of course. And the instructor or the librarian as instructor is really there to guide them. So it's a lot more of, of having the students empowered and they're, they have more of a part in their instruction. Um, they're more res responsible for the, the class instruction. So for an example, I have a class that comes in every summer and it's the Inbury students who come to campus for six weeks and uh, they are there for, they work in the labs with the professors and they, uh, at the end of their term of their six weeks, they have to make a poster and do some research to find articles for their posters. So I get to work with them at the beginning of their time and they come in for a one shot class, which is an introduction to PubMed. Some of them do already know how to search. Some of them don't. So what I do is I have them register so that I have their emails and then I can send them the instructions ahead of time for them to watch one of the PubMed tutorials. And I start with the finding articles by subject. And those are located, well, let's see if I can show you. Hmm. Okay. There. So those tutorials are uh, over here under using PubMed. There are two different places you can find them. One is the PubMed Quick Start Guide. And those are right here, and there's a list. And the other is under the PubMed tutorial, and then under the quick tours, there's the search basics. And these right here are very simple, brief tutorials. They're only two minutes long. And those are really nice for the students because they're interactive. They have to actually go in and answer, go along and answer a question before they can go forward with it. But they're real short and I use those. So, um, They've seen that when they come into the class, they've already seen that article, uh, video on finding articles by subject. So I, when they come in, I'll play that video for them and review that. And then we can talk about it and if they have any questions. Let me catch up here. And then after that, Virginia, I will. Virginia, I'm sorry, yes. this is John. Your slides aren't on your screen. Are you okay. sharing your screen? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Ah. Okay, how's that? Can you see them now? We're good. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, trying to get this synchronized. All right. So after the subject search, then I will go ahead and demonstrate how to do the author journal citation search and also the mesh and talk about how mesh works and why it's used. And there's room, usually room or some time to play another video at that point, which is the one on mesh building a better PubMed query. So then the active portion, the active learning portion comes. And the reason that I think it's good for these students, I think that it promotes a better retention for them when they're more involved in the class rather than just listening to the lecture. And if somebody, maybe somebody doesn't learn as well just by listening, if they watch the video, they might learn and remember more. And also, I think that they can go ahead and think about how they're understanding the material and they can talk with each other about the contents and share their own thoughts about it. So after we've seen the MeSH video, then we, I will go ahead and divide the students into groups of like four or five each. And um, each, one, each one of the groups will be assigned one type of search. And if they need an idea, I will give them an example of a topic maybe or an author or something that I know they can find. <laughs> and then one person from each group will be the leader or the spokesman. So that person, you know, I'll give them time to work on their search and then like maybe five minutes or so, then each group has a spokesman come up to the front and go ahead and demonstrate. And this is actually, actually like teaching a part of the class because they'll have the screen down and they'll be showing them the steps of doing these searches. And they, I think they really like doing that. Um, they seem to enjoy it. And they, they like talking to each other about the topics and so forth when they're in their groups. So then we have time for questions and feedback. And the feedback from, from their, men, their um, the other class members, you know, their, their, they seem to take that better than feedback from me, <laughs> me as an instructor. I think they, they kind of, you know, give more credence to what their classmates say about what they've done. So then um, for assessment, for that type of class with that, I'm not going to see them again unless they come in for help. So that's like a one shot. So I would typically use a minute paper assessment for them for that class. And some of the questions might be, for one, what is the most significant or meaningful thing you have learned during the session? And they can discuss more than one if they want. And another one is, please list one thing that you still don't understand. And if you would like a librarian to contact you for help, please include your email. Another one could be, if you could change something about this session, what would it be? So that's the minute paper. And then if I have a class that I'm going to see more than once, uh, I will have a rubric. Um, after they have, I will have them do an assignment of performing the searches in the class, and then I will use a rubric to grade that. So that would, that's how I would assess that when I'm coming back for another class. So again, why I like this type of strategy instead of a typical lecture is it's something that you can adapt to other class levels. You can, you can take this concept and use it for more advanced. I also teach an advanced PubMed class. We go into things like using my NCBI and saving searches and setting up search alert and so on. So you can use this concept for another higher level besides the basics. And um, like I said before, it gets the students more involved in their own 
instruction, which I think they like. And as you can see from these pictures or photographs demonstrating on the left, they're passively receiving the information from a lecture, which is more of a traditional approach. And then on the right, they are engaged and interacting. And that's, that's an idea or that's a representation of the active learning. So that's all I had. If you have any questions, put them in the chat box. Thank you. Okay, great, Virginia. Thanks so much. All right, so next um, presenter we have is Margaret Vugren from Texas Tech Health Sciences Center. Margaret, all yours. Ah, thank you, John. Uh, I'm Margaret Bugrin. I'm a reference librarian at Texas Tech Health Science Center in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, we have a medical school, we have a health science center, we have nursing, allied health, a uh, wide gamut of students that we have. And is my screen up and you could all see it? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I've been doing this for a long time and searching scare students. It really does. And remember in the old days where we used to point and click and, and go right here and there and tell them where to do it. So that was the old way. But, you know, it, searching is hard. And Google is easier. And what have your students said? You know, how, what have they done to get information? So this was originally designed as a presentation to be used in a class. So there's more text than I would do when I'm doing this on a one-on-one -on -one or a group in the situation. But the first thing I have the students do is pull out a piece of paper, which if you're gonna do this, you have to bring the paper because almost nobody has paper anymore. It's all done on the computer. And the reason I do it this way is because one of the students came back about four years ago and she said, I saved it. And so that's why we do it on paper. So put all the dots on there. And this represents all of the journals and the published literature. So there's thousands and thousands, right? And different databases, the circles here show different databases, uh, have different journals within them. And sometimes like on the left side, you see that some databases have the same journals. So the two blue dots are in both of those databases, okay? And indexing refers to the organization of data, which is like tags in Twitter. I try to make things simple. I use simple examples when I work with the students. Um, for, I'm really thrilled when I get first years because they're big sponges, but we also get them uh, as honors students that are in the summer program. Uh, we do one-on-ones in the third year in medicine, we have a fourth year elective that the students take. So uh, we're just going to be looking at one database today and we're going to look at one of those circles and that circle has 29 million records in it. So here's the exercise. So basically find PubMed and what we're going to do is we're going to type in a combination of symbols because the database does not recognize this as a word. These are symbols. So when you put those symbols in that you and I can understand this diabetes, the database looks at all of the dots and it makes a pile. It makes a pile of those articles that have those work combination of symbols and a pile that doesn't. And the screen capture on the bottom there shows you that when this original presentation was created, it was 59,000. It is up to 665,000 now. So it locates where diabetes exists, okay? However, then the question is, will it locate diabetic? And as we know, it will not, it will be an incidental finding because obviously articles that deal with diabetes will talk about diabetic something or other because it's only looking for the occurrence of the word. It's all, and when you do that, it will also find, as a keyword, it will find, and the patient also has diabetes, period, end of sentence. But it's all about lung cancer. So we're trying to avoid those things. And obviously, the students can't go through all that material. 
So what I try to do is help empower them by going to Mesh, because there we could search for the concept or with the concept. Okay. So again, we do the same kind of a thing, and this time our results are 100, and they all get kind of perplexed. Well, we had 590,000, then we had 665. How do we get to only 100? I, I think it's really important for the students to understand how the database is built. And then we explain that these are all concepts, right? So they will be tagged for a concept, okay? So just a little bit about the mechanics. This part is easy. Most of us know how to do that. And here we have our um, mesh page that we're all familiar with, I'm hoping, okay. So here is our circle. The circle, everything within the circle is inside of mesh. Everything within is tagged for the subject heading. Everything outside are, and the patient also has diabetes type articles possibly, okay? So we go from this image and the students are drawing alongside me as we do this. So they all have, they're creating their own picture. And then when we look at the screenshot that you see here, we now have half of the articles that we had before, okay? And don't forget to have the students label their circles, et cetera, because when they come back a year later and it's labeled, they'll know where they're going. They'll know what they found. So next question, what do adjectives do? And everybody knows what their second grade teacher told them. They modify, they describe their subject headings. So I start off with the concept that subheadings, and I don't even call them subheadings initially. I say, here's some adjectives that describe our topic. We have surgery of, we have rehabilitation of, et cetera. And so the students are picking up, oh, okay, and I have them make some selections as well. So they get familiar with what are some of those 76 different adjectives, different subheadings that we have. Again, we choose one. And when we choose it, we have, we draw on our page that we have now chosen a piece of pie, a piece of the mesh concept. And again, our numbers are greatly reduced. We're down to 22,000. Okay, it's getting much better. It's more efficient. Okay. So we can also focus our material very well by using the link to restrict to mesh major topic. And the image that I use here is I, I usually ask them, do they have a cat? And cats have their eyes are in the front of their face. They're predators, they look for things. Most of them have dogs and most dogs eyes are on the side. But what about horses? And Horses' eyes are wide, as we see here, and we put blinders when they run in the races so that, therefore, they can focus on our topic in the same way we can focus on our topic. And again, the numbers are getting lower. I'm not using a subheading here. That's why we're back up to 291,000, but notice it also tells us that we are focused because it says major after our term. So this time we're going to use our subheading, our adjective, as well as our major focus, and we will get only the tip of the iceberg, okay? So knowing how, how the materials within the database are organized, I think it's very important for the students. The next example that I used, you see the screenshot on the bottom that we all notice that that's advanced. I talked to them about, you know, are you in any sports? Yeah, so where do you put your, your gear when you're, you know, when you're playing on the field? Well, you put it in your locker, your buddy holds on to it. So this is what advanced does for us. And if you notice all the way on the right side, it gives you the description of what each line meant. All the dots are just the keyword, big circle is the subject heading, et cetera. So once you've strategized this, then you can figure out how to narrow it down. Typically, uh, you're going to combine it with one or with two or more concepts. And how you combine them will make a big difference. So here we talk about ORs, okay? So I wanna make sure that they understand how to use the Boolean operators. 
If you have two subjects, I'd translate it. Here you have diabetes mellitus or hypertension. Okay, so they could substitute for the A's and B's and for some of my other lightweight uh, subject topics, something more serious to theirs. And here we have how to use and. Okay. Now, sometimes we want to use or as well as and. And in that case, we have our first combination. We always do our ors first. And then we throw in our second. And this is our and. So only the material within the jagged line is going to appear. And sometimes we want to be much more specific. So therefore, we're going to use the A and B. We want that intersection. And here comes our, in this case, our Hispanic American group. And we're only going to see the, those articles in that small section. Now, what is the most important part of research? I sat in on a research webinar, actually, it was a face-to-face, -face, it wasn't a webinar recently. And the most important part of your research is the question. If you don't know what the question is, if you're too broad, you'll never get the correct answers. So this is a part of, that helps a student uh, get to the point of what they're looking for. And I developed this part of it in January. I added this to the previous section. So you find an article. I don't care how you found this article. You could Google it. You can, you know, keyword it. You found an article. Here's an example on the screen. Here it is. So then what I have the students do is I have them review the abstract that's here and list the important words. And so there's metformin, there's pregnancy, etc. And I have them copy this abstract and take it into any one of the word cloud software programs. Now you could clean up those software, the words that you're dropping into a cloud program. I use this uh, word clouds and you could clean up the text if you want to, but notice the terms that are sticking out. You know, that helps them see in the visual format what is important in this article. So what I did was with that group is I gave them some articles and I asked them to create word clouds. So each group of students got a word cloud. And I went through these in advance uh, to make sure that they would bring up reasonable word clouds. And that's why I put the PMIDs on there so it's much easier for, for them and for myself to be able to go back to those. So. Now comes the third part. So how do you use these skills? Now that you've, you, know, you know how the database is built, you've seen that there are important terms with it, within that, so how do you use them? So before you even touch the keyboard, I have them identify the why, what is the issue, what is the problem, how could you make it better for someone? What are you passionate about? If you're in a research project and you absolutely hate the topic, it's not gonna work out well. So try and find something that you are passionate about or that the faculty that you're working with is passionate about. And we have a PICO worksheet that also helps them to kind of formulate their questions. So we have them do that as well. And then we play the matching game. Okay, so these are the pieces that you have to work with. We have subjects, we have our subheadings, we have our filters, okay? So list five important terms or more or less. That would help you find terms, okay? That would help you find articles on your topic. So just have a list, okay? And then here's an, an example, okay? So I'm looking for review articles on the prevention of knee injuries in female adolescent soccer players. Pretty easy, straightforward question. But what do we do next? We write our terms down and then we play a matching exercise, right? So, oh, fil review is a filter. Prevention is a subheading. Like female is a filter. Knee injuries, oh, it's a subject. Adolescent, I think that's a filter. Now, soccer players usually throws them because when they are looking at that, you know, we're in a biomedical database, so what about soccer players? But by process of elimination, they figure that it most likely is a subject, 
okay? And it also helps them when, when they, because the next step is that they actually sit down on the keyboard and find these articles or using these terms that they found. Um, and then they have to find out that there are synonyms, okay? So if soccer players won't work, which is what most of them start off with, then they go to soccer or they go to sports or they go to athletics, et cetera. And notice the dashed line between subject heading and subject. That's showing us that it is a subheading and it goes with one of the subject headings. And actually I added that this afternoon or this morning because I thought that's an important concept to have with this as well. I always suggest that they use all of their subject terms before they apply filters because otherwise you don't know what you're missing. So now it's their turn, okay? Take out a sheet of paper, decide how you're, what you're looking for, you've played the matching game, do the visual yourself so you know how you're going to do the combinations. And I've used this successfully in one-on-ones uh, with the student taking the lead in the second portion of it. I've done it in large group presentations. Again, you have to bring your own paper. Uh, colored markers are great and I have them switch, you know, if they start off with the red marker, I have them switch with the neighbor that has a blue marker because then it shows up better. Um, it's been embedded in a nursing class and then they've sent me uh, pictures of their results. And I presented it at a regional meeting uh, in Albuquerque about two years ago, and some of the people said it was the best presentation. So I think it works. I know it works because the students are successful. They don't have to know everything about the database. You can always come back to me or to one of the librarians to get more specific. When your question isn't working, come on back. But I think once they know that they can do this, they have that takeaway, the sheet that they take with them. It helps them to remember what the steps were. And I just actually looked at um, the new PubMed labs. There will be a way to work with the MeSH terms. It's going to be a little bit different for all of us and for our students, but I think it will still, this presentation will still work. So I just checked that actually right before John called me. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And I hope that you, if you are interested in using this, it will be posted for you all. Give me a call, send me an email. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Margaret. So our last speaker is Annie Zeidman Karpinski from the University of Oregon. So Annie, all yours. Anna, you're muted. Okay, so now everyone, uh, everyone's seeing the wrong screen, and um, but you can hear me. Okay, now you should be seeing the right screen. Is that right? Okay, thank you, thank you, Libby. All right, terrific. Um, everyone's probably getting a little bit antsy. They've been sitting here patiently for a while. So I'm going to try to get you all to use your chat window for um, uh, answering a couple of my questions in addition to answering um, or asking the questions that you have as well. Um, that is a tough act to follow, but I'm going to try. So. Hey, Annie, this is John. I'm sorry. We can't see your slides. Why can't you see my slides? Um, share your screen. Yep, I'm sharing my screen. Is that... Um, how about that? Mm, nope. I'm not seeing, no, we're not seeing them. Let's see. Dual monitor or something yeah, could be sharing again. the wrong screen. Okay, it says screen sharing has failed. How lovely. Try this again. Okay. Uh, How about now? Yes. And are you seeing, um, you're seeing the wrong screen though, right? We're seeing the presenter view now. Okay, how, about, how about now? 
Yes. Okay. Uh, my apologies, everyone. Okay. Terrific. Um, and um, I am sorry. I would like to just try. Um, I can't see the chat window right now, so I'm going to try to work on that in just a moment. Um, but um, let me get started. So um, here is what we're going to be working on um, in the next few minutes. Uh, we're going to. Um, I'm going to introduce this game that um, I've been using for uh, an undergraduate class. I'm going to review the game, talk about the legs that we use, and then also talk about the different formats. I just want to also thank Miriam Rigby and um, Nook Yong Ch uh, Tran, who taught, um, who developed this idea for first year students, and um, and then I modified it for um, for students for PubMed. And can I just confirm one more time that everyone is seeing this the screen that I'm reading from? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Margaret. Okay, so um, in the original game, you can have a couple of different legs. It just depends on how much time you have. Four legs uh, will work. Five legs you can probably get in. Um, and um, the idea is for uh, folks to work in groups and then complete these challenges and then um, win the race. There are prizes for everybody, although in my version of the race, everyone gets the same prize. So in the PubMed race that I wanted to talk to you guys about, um, we, I use four legs, although I'm kind of cheating. There are four legs in class and then there's an additional homework leg. Um, I have folks work in teams of two, teams of three will work, although it gets a little weird when you have um, everyone's a team of, of two and then one is a team of three. It seems like the, the team that has one more is always on a different, slightly different pace, sometimes slower, you're usually slower. So once you complete a leg, everyone brings their slip of paper up to the front of the class and then they get checked and, um, and then they get the next leg. And um, this is uh, just to sort of emphasize that um, we're all winners when we, um, when we learn, uh, but the um, element of competition is a part of the gameplay of this when it's played in class. So um, when, when we have a class, usually I try to say just a few things about um, setting up the game get people into their groups. Um, everyone's giving a slip of paper. There's like kind of a dramatic countdown. And then, um, and then I explain that teams are going to have to come up to the front of the class. So they're moving around during class. Um, all the teams have to, um, have to complete everything. We have a little bit of a wrap up and then we review the homework at the end of class. And this is for a 50 minute class, 5-0 minutes. So um, you can do any number of different things. It's super modifiable. Um, I'm just gonna show you the one that I use for a particular class and I'll explain what kind of a class I use it for in just a moment. Um, it starts with something about the library site, especially getting them to the research guide for the subject. Then it has them using um, PubMed and also our interlibrary loan buttons. I then have them sort of take that information and try to apply it to Google, um, Google Scholar or Web of Science and then make sure that they know how to get help then their homework leg is going to um, have them sort of integrate all of those pieces. And the key is that each leg builds on each other. So um, here I'm going to have you take a quick look at this. I'm gonna to try to mess around with my screen so I can see the chat menu. I'd like for you just to take a moment to look at that. Is everyone able to see that fairly clearly? It's big on my screen. Okay, let me see if I can get... Um, sorry. Um, so I wanted, sorry, I wanted to go back one. Okay, terrific. So you're getting, you're able to see some of that. I'm so sorry, I still can't figure out how to, um, how to also see the chat window. So I'm just gonna keep moving through this. Um, so now that you've seen sort of the first leg, I'd like for you to take a look at the second leg. Annie, this is John. Uh, yeah. Aloha said at the top of your screen, for chat, you should see a more option to the right. Yeah, I'm looking at that and then- um, it's Click on that to see it. your chat box. Thanks, Alois. She's always saving our, our pods, so thank you for that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks everyone for all of your help. Um, is it all worked fine when we were looking at it? Um, when we're practicing everything. So um, here's the next leg. And um, I've given you kind of a big sign here but what I want you to notice especially is that in the first leg, we gave them very specific instructions. And, um, and in this one, I've given them far fewer instructions. And at this point, I've sort of, um, I've still kind of given them an example and I'm asking them to kind of follow along and also to find something, um, kind of find something as well that, um, that, that they, might, they might be using in a class like the, um, and this is for something that we call human physiology. 
So you can see that there's far fewer instructions. I'm asking them to, to go to the database and perform a search and then um, and to do a bunch of things with it. This leg can take a little bit of time and, um, and also requires some, um, some help as we go through it. The next part of it is, um, this is still on the same eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And at the very bottom, I asked them to look for an article. You'll notice it's from 1995. So I carefully looked for an article that was somewhat easy to find, but that we didn't have electronically so that they had a chance to use, find um, to use our, um, our linking system to, um, to request an interlibrary loan. Um, although the, the leg requires that they show us that they filled it out or they found out how to fill it out and then ask them not to actually request the article unless they wanted to read it for their own purposes. And I found that um, interlibrary loan is the one skill that they forget most and they're gonna need the most as they go through, um, through their career. Um, at, at the, as undergraduates. Here's the third leg. So you can see I've asked them to go to Web of Science. Do you also see that I haven't asked, I haven't given them very much, um, I haven't given them very much um, information about how to get to that. So I'm expecting that they're gonna remember how to get to Web of, Web of Science. And if they don't remember, I've given them a little, um, do you, if you need help finding this, remember to go to the research legs, um, research guides in legs one and two. So I've sort of given them a couple of hints. Okay, so here's an example of sort of a final leg. You can, um, some of them, uh, some of them have done just using a live chat so that we know that they know how to use the live chat. I end up sort of cramming a bunch more information in there. Generally, these are things that students have asked me about. So reserving study spaces, um, how can you find me? Uh, if you, um, and then this third question, hover over the services menu, connect from off campus, so they, um, so they know about how to use our VPN, and then another way to make sure that they've asked us for help. And so then um, the, final, the final instruction is get your homework round questions and claim your prize. Oh, I'm gonna put in the chat menu, which I can now see. Uh, I'm going to also put in um, a URL uh, this is um, a site I just learned about, um, OSF. It's free and it has um, links to the a Word document with the legs. It also has links to the slides, uh, also a link to um, my Mendeley, uh, Mendeley file with, uh, with uh, resources and, and uh, various other things. So that's in the chat menu right now. Okay, here's the homework leg where I've asked them to um, sort of integrate all of the work that they had done and, and also use a Mendeley, um, use Mendeley account, which they'll need to use for the rest of their time on, um, as human physiology students. Let me talk to you just a little, while we're here, let me talk to you just a little bit about the class that I use this for and, um, and also um, sort of some of the, the theory behind it. So now that you have a sense of what I'm talking about. So this is for a 200 level class in our human physiology major. And it's one of our largest majors on campus. And it's kind of a pre-allied health major. Students can also, you know, obviously um, major in biology or chemistry if they're thinking of, grad of graduate school or medical school. Does anyone else who's listening have something like this in um, teach undergrads who are kind of allied health as opposed to like specifically medical school? Great, I have a couple of folks, yep, okay, good. So this was modified from a much simpler version of, um, of the game uh, that was just sort of an introduction to the library. So this is kind of getting at specific resources. Let me talk a little bit about why using gameplay is useful. Yeah, exercise science, John is exactly right. Um, so um, there's a time limit on this and we all have time limits. We have a certain amount of time for, um, for, uh, for our classes. So. Uh, with the clock ticking and sort of the, you know, all the different teams working, their uh, students are sort of able to see what's happening. I also, each of these legs, I'm showing it here on the slides, they're all with um, black lettering on a white background, but when I photocopy it, I put it on different color paper so I can kind of look around the room to make sure I know where everyone is and which leg they're on. Um, there's also, a, there's some element of competition with people sort of can, the teams kind of competing with each other. There's scaffolding. Did you see the scaffolding? There was more explicit instruction in the first leg and then less and less as the legs went along. There's, um, there are clues. It's, um, it's heavily text-based. It turns out a lot of the students are playing video games that have a lot of text. So I'm asking them to read and understand and then do something with that, which um, I think is supported by the literature and also by the gameplay of the uh, video games that, um, that are popular today. We've chunked the information into smaller bits. 
and then ask students to work with it and then we give them quick feedback so after every two or three questions they're coming back to us to kind of check the results that's an incredibly important part of the game um, of how people learn and also um, how we get and how games are effective in a way and ways to learn so you try something you find out if you did it if it worked or you um, or you have to revise it um so that is something that we tell them that if they get a wrong answer they can ask for help but um, i'm going to have them go back and um, and revise it until it's correct Okay, and um, and then um, so um, there's um, and I've used this for uh, this is this is generally done in a class of about twenty five students. It's a it's the discussion sections of a larger class. Uh, so the gameplay this way when it's live, uh, it does need to be something that you can reasonably check. And I I also the other nice thing about doing this in a discussion section is that usually there are some questions that come up. That will sort of come up for lots of people so you can have folks circulating but then as um as the teaching assistants get more uh comfortable with the answers they can start checking the answers as well so you can kind of get everyone involved the um other thing i'll just point out on this homework leg i've asked them to use the library um kick scanner the library scanners to upload a copy so that they've had to like find another library resource one other thing that i haven't mentioned um is that um, an important part of the gameplay is also getting them moving around. So um, there are a couple different ways to get them moving around. One is that after every leg, they have to get every three or four questions, they have to get up and come to the front of the class and everyone in the team has to come up to the front of the class. And there's good research about moving your bodies are good thing, are, um, is a good way to learn. The um, other thing that I've been able to do is when there's enough time in the class, I have a shelfy leg. So they have to go to the anatomy physiology section of the library, um, get a book off the shelf, take a shelfie with it, and um, and then uh, show me the class, show me that. Or if they want, they can bring the book back with them. So um, that's the shelfie leg I'm showing you now. Um, and then um, also by having them um, look at the call number, I get them to think about how the call numbers are um, are associated with a particular topic. Okay. So um, I edit the legs of the race. Um, I customize them. I, improve, I change them almost every time I play it. There's something that comes up that didn't quite work out. Print out the legs. Um, if you're having them move around the building, then there's a map of the building. This is for um, playing it um, in the main library. In my library, it's a much smaller map. Um, there's an answer sheet so that the um, the graduate student assistant teachers and the learning assistant undergraduates who are helping with the class can also answer questions. And then you can either create or purchase prizes. I do have a button maker. So um, can you all see I have the I Heart UL Libraries button here for them. That's a specific prize for the, um, for the research race for human physiology's class. So variation and um, and potent variations and potential. So we have, um, if you go to the link that I put in the chat, you'll see that we um, had sort of a mock up of how we might use it if we were going to just use it as a Google form. So um, each of the leg, each of the legs is kind of broken up um, in different ways in Google Forms. So you could have those questions asked as multiple choice questions. Uh, we then a few years ago, one of the teachers turned this um, in person class into an online class. And so he made a canvas if we use learn the learning management system as canvas, he made canvas quizzes for all of the legs. And it's not it some of the element of gameplay doesn't re really gets lost in that. However, it does let you have pretty quick feedback. So that, that element is kept. Uh, so, and I also put a, a zip file package. So if you have Canvas or if you wanna create a free Canvas account on the, free, the version of free Canvas, you can at least see what that would look like. That one was from uh, 2017. So there are some things that have changed and obviously with PubMed changing, it will need to change again. So what else did I wanna share with you in my last remaining minutes? Um, so feed, oops, excuse me, feedback from students. Um, here are some quotes that we've gotten from it. I just wanted to share with you that one, one day I was going to class and, um, and I saw a, um, a student who had been taking it the year before and she was sitting studying with her friend, her boyfriend, and she said, um, are you doing them the, the, the amazing race? And I said, yes. She said, oh, I'm so excited for my friend. I was telling him how wonderful it was that he got to do this. So at least one student liked it enough that she was excited that her friend was going to get a chance to do it. Um, we've generally gotten very good feedback. Also, um, let me just really quickly ask a quick question. When you give students computers or permission to use their computers, what happens to those students? What do they do with their computers? On their phones, they're doing email. Has anyone seen their students online shopping? 
checking Facebook. So the, what I can tell you about this, yes, thank you, um, they're surfing. So what I can tell you about this is that my job is to circulate as they're answering these questions and they remain on task. They're um, held accountable to staying on task with their teammate and um, they're not checking their phones because they're racing or they're, you know, they're trying to stay focused and, um, and they're not surfing because they're trying to find answers to these questions. So I would say that um, what I find is that um, aside from the, fact, the feedback from faculty and students, what I see is them staying on task and actually participating in, this, um, in the, these activities, which I think is really important. I also, um, at the very beginning of the race, when I pass everything out, they're sort of all hard at work. So I have to spend, usually spend a few minutes talking to the instructor and saying, so I know it looks like I'm just standing around, but I spent hours prepping this. And what I see is the students being on task and engaged. So I do try to point that out to them. Okay, terrific. I think that's everything that I wanted to make sure to cover here, um, and I'm also out of time. Okay, so um, we will answer questions, um, I think, now. And should I stop sharing my screen, John? Yeah, go ahead, Annie. Thanks so much. Okay, so um, great job for our presenters, and now I'm going to turn it over to Shannon Johnson, who's been keeping track of questions. Um, Shannon, all yours. All right. Well, let's go in reverse here, order here and we can start with Annie. Um, we had a question for you. Uh, could we get a copy of the original game? Would you be willing to share that? Oh, yes. Um, so the original, um, and I'm sorry, so the, 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 the game that I sort of put up here, that's already on the OSF site as a Word document. So do feel free to download it and then customize it. But if you want one for first year um, students, then I can do that as well. So maybe just put in the in the chat whether or not you want the first year student one. Um, our second question was, do students struggle with a certain leg of the game more than others? Yes, um, there will be legs where they kind of get caught up in something. And so then I try the next time, uh, I try the next time to make the, like at least the things that kind of snag them easier. So like I had a, I had them looking for a very relevant article, but the last name was really hard to spell. So I tried to find another relevant article where the last name was easier to spell, things like that. And yes, so the you know, first year, I will definitely post a first year, um, a first year version. Um, do you give them any kind of an introduction before you start the game or do you just drop them straight into the game? I, I do about as much, I just do something along the lines of, you know, I'm, I'm here, we're going to play this, we're going to play this race, it's going to help you, I just like, you know, quick orientation or just like a quick, you know, what are the rules of the game um, more so, um, you're going to get these, you're working in teams, you're going to get these legs, you have to bring, everyone has to fill everything out, you have to bring it up to the front of the classroom but I try not to talk too much. Um, we just had a new question come in on chat and I, th I think it's a clarification of what you just said. So um, is the whole 50 minutes is the race then and there's no lecture portion? Uh, there's, there's no lecture portion. It's going, um, they're gonna get some additional um, practice with the homework portion. Um, I'd say I, I aim for it to be of a 50 minute class, I aim for it to be about 40 minutes. So we have a few minutes to get settled and get started. And then a few minutes at the end to, um, to wrap up and explain what the homework is going to be. And generally, this isn't the only time I'm going to see them. If um, I see them a little bit um, in this class, sometimes I see them in another, in another discussion section, there's a little bit of time in lecture class. And then I also get to see them, I should say too, this is sort of their 200 level research methods class. I'm going to see most of them in their capstone classes as well a few years later. Do all students complete all legs of the game? Most of, the, most of the students complete all of it. Um, a few teams generally um, uh, don't complete the last, that last help leg. And I always tell that I always hand it out to them with their homework leg and tell them that um, if they want to complete it, it would help them because it has things about study spaces and using uh, VPN for using off-campus access. Great. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, everyone. Um, just to keep the conversation moving, let's move uh, on to Margaret. Margaret? Yes. Okay. Um, we had a couple questions for you come in. Uh, somebody wanted to know how long is your average class session? Okay. The presentation with the dots and circles and the piece of paper takes about less than 15 minutes. And it's amazing how quickly they can capture the information that's being presented because then they get the keyboard and, and they've done the matching game of whatever their question might be. And since they know how to manipulate the database, um, they can do their search 
in, you know, another 10 minutes. And, you know, I, I constantly throw in additional pieces of information as they're doing it, but within a half hour, they know what they're doing. Obviously, our, our sessions take a little bit longer. You kind of want to know what their area of specialization is going to be, so you could throw in examples that might go with what their interest level is. Great. Um, and somebody else asked if you could give a little bit more background on how you were able to embed it into the nursing curriculum. Oh, uh, we have a clinical research institute, and they had a, um, one of their monthly programs, and I was chatting with one of the nursing faculty afterward, and she was saying that, well, we tend to have most of our chat questions come from nursing students. And she was teaching a new class, and I said, you know, I've, I've, I told her what I do, and she said, oh, that would be great to do this for the class. So that is the front part of my presentation with the dots and circles, as I call it. And then I gave them examples that they had to do it. And then they had, to, that was when they had to send me screen captures or, or pictures on their phone of their, uh, what they found at the end. Um, so, and then we, the prof and I talked about their results and they had many less questions from the chat that is through the library and they did much better on their uh, homework assignments for, for her. So that was kind of, I've been here 30 years, so I've developed relationships with various faculty, and that was one of them. So that made it easy to get it embedded into the class. Great, thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Virginia, we had some questions for you. Give you a second to, to switch over here. Um, there was a request to see if we could get a copy of your rubric and actually that question came up from a lot of people so I'm just gonna ask point blank if any of our participants are willing to share their rubric or their assignment sheet if they would uh, email it to John or I I can add it to the libguide for the HSIG that way everybody can get to the resources in one spot and I intend to go back through this chat transcript and add all the links to the libguide that have been mentioned as well um, Please give me a few days to do that. I'll have to wait till I get the recording back. Um, but our second question for Virginia was, uh, what are the typical responses that you get to the one minute papers and what's the feedback like? Virginia, are you there? Yes, we I'm here. Have... Sorry. Okay. I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, okay. Um, t okay, great. Um, usually, the thing that they are the most impressed with is using mesh. Because when I explain how they can um, refine their search and go from like maybe a couple thousand results to a much more manageable amount of a hundred or so they you know that that seems to impress them and um, they usually don't say too much about what they would improve because they don't really know that much at that point these are usually undergrads who haven't may not have ever used med before um, but that's usually it mesh um. okay thank you can't thank me um, yes all right thank you John for adding the our contact information into the chat um, Nancy I did have a slew of questions for you if you're still there okay. great um, we had some questions about how you made the videos uh, could you tell us what program you used and were they ADA compliant? Um, so I can answer that. The videos were made with Camtasia and um, we did um, put subheadings um, or closed captioning, closed captioning yeah. sorry, with them. Um, so if I recall um, Nancy made the original videos. I updated them a couple years ago. Um, I think on YouTube it'll transcribe it for you, but then I actually went through and edited it and made sure that it was all correct and punctuated. 
and all of that. But we just did a, a simple screen capture with Camtasia. Thank you. Um, are there any consequences for students that do badly on the assignment? Yes, we had a minimum score of, I think, seven out of 10. If you got below seven, so if you got six or below, you did not pass the assignment. And you, it was a mastery type of assignment. So you, ha it, this was given, I think it was the, sec the first or the second week of the course, and it was a 13 week long course. So after we graded them, we contacted any of the individuals who did not pass, and we provided additional instruction, and they had to do another, um, they had to do it until they passed. We would give them another, another vignette not the same vignette, so they, they had to kind of start fresh. So Are if they didn't the assignment, then they would not pass the entire course. So we communicated with the course directors for that, for that medical school course and told them, you know, at a certain, once everybody did pass, we were like, okay, everybody's done. So this, this particular requirement for the course is, is all good. Were the type of questions you got from the students typically complex or more simple background type questions? At that point, they had not been, it was way too early in their, in their um, medical school career for them to be asking like clinical questions. So they had not received any instruction on how to do a PICO question, which they get in the first part of the second year of medical school. Um, so they varied, you know, yeah. you saw the one that I posted, that was a pretty complex question. Um, one of the people wrote, um, she did, I remember she, her question was more like on um, a, a humanities type aspect of, of communication with mm -hmm. the patient or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, and then there are of course ones that were just background information, something specific about muscular dystrophy they were interested in. Right, yeah. But at that point that's okay because the purpose of the assignment was to have them be able to search PubMed so that they could find um, learning materials for their problem-based learning cases in which they are learning all about um, different um, diagnoses. And disorders. We just had some questions coming in about grading. Uh, there were people wanting to know on average how many students are you grading assignments for and about how long does it take? I think it was uh, last, the past year was like 144, something mm -hmm. like 144. Mm -hmm. um, we have about 150 students per medical class. So, and we divide the grading. Um, last year, we divided it among four librarians, including Nancy and myself. So, it doesn't take super long to grade. Um, this definitely took longer to grade than the original assignment we mm -hmm. had them doing, but it's not an unreasonable amount of work. Great, thank you. Um, we did have some questions come in that I think could go to any of our panelists, so I'm just going to throw them out there and see who'd like to take it. Uh, we had a couple people asking, is it realistic for them to continue to, using, continue to use MeSH after they're done with your assignments or your video sections, whatnot? Um, I can start that if you like. Uh, we've had we've had students when they've gone on for their residency interviews and they've had to do presentations and they've come back to us and told us that their audience the residents and the faculty were really impressed that they could do a real search so from that perspective I think it's really important yeah I would like to add um, that you know sure if a, if a physician we're, we're teaching them to be we're teaching future physicians if a physician is in a patient care kind of setting where they have to find an answer super fast, they might not use MeSH. But don't forget that physicians have to, they might need to do their own self-directed learning on a topic, you know, at, at home or in their office. And, and they might need to do a more thorough search or they might um, need to find, maybe they're trying to find the latest, um, you know, or the Real, do a real deep dive into a certain topic for treatment of a patient that they've never has a disorder that they've never um, treated before. So there's there's not just you know quick super quick searches in PubMed that you would need to be doing as a physician. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we help physicians and residents all the time with using Mesh. Um, you know, it's a valuable tool to learn, and I think it's completely reasonable to expect them to be able to use it. Um, we had a couple other questions. 
that were specific to different aspects of mesh and public med. One of them was how do you handle it when a student um, has a search that doesn't include all of the headings? I saw that one earlier when it came on. This is Margaret. And I wasn't exactly sure what Christine meant by that, but if they have put in those, I think it came up that there were nine articles and only two of them had all of the headings, is, if that's correct. Yes. It yes. may be that um, if it was an explode, if there were some of the terms that came out below it, that's why, although it didn't have surveys and questionnaire, it may have had uh, something else, a checklist as a sub, uh, sub mesh heading that that's why it came out as a possibility for that answer. Does that make sense? When we looked at that one as well, it's kind of far back. I can't relocate it at the moment, but it seems, if I remember, it was a very large number of mesh headings and it together. Um, so if a student would, I think, to approach me about that, I would say you have too many headings and it together. Oh, there it is again. Um, so it's uh, Parkinson's disease and quality of life and surveys and questions. So that's five, five headings right there. You just handed yourself right out of results. Um, so like to me, patience would be a superfluous term. And one of the things we address in our video is not using superfluous terms. Um, so in this particular instance, that's an unnecessary term to combine in there. If that answers the question. Yes, yes, it does. Um, we did have another question, if I can find it here. Um, how do you guys explain to students that not all PubMed pub articles contain MeSH as a field? Mm -hmm. That's usually when I explain, after we've done the MeSH and after they're comfortable with that, then I bring them to the, oh, by the way, uh, there are terms that have been put into the database quickly so that you have access to them, but then they're actually just the keyword searching that comes up with those. And the other thing that I discovered recently, if you look at the, on the PubMed homepage where it says journals by uh, that are currently indexed, I don't remember what the heading is. Um, if you look, if you put in a journal title and pull it up, and it's one of those PubMed central journal journals, when you look at that, it, instead of having mesh, it will have a conflict of interest statement, which shows up, which I hadn't realized, noticed before last month or so. So I think with those two options, that may help answer some of those questions, at least from my perspective. I think one of the, I think the video for mesh searching that we produced here at the College of Medicine, and we put the links in the chat, it does address that, and I think, um, it was like, you know, saying that if you want the very latest um, things that are published, you would not want to use MeSH, but then you have the trade-off of it not being a super precise search. So, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think they also explain um, in some point in those videos that all the articles that go into Medline um, are actually touched by a human person and indexed. So it's kind of explained in that way. Thank you, everyone. Um, did I miss any questions from the chat or does anybody have anything else that they would like to ask? Do you ever talk about the automatic mesh mapping feature? We don't in our videos. Um, of course it does happen. Like it does automatically map, but um, we kind of, I guess, just on more basic concepts and just, you know, there's, mm -hmm. so we make sure that we understand what meshes and what keywords are, and then sure, yeah, it's automatic. Yeah. But sometimes you do need to actually take the, um, take the initiative to search for the mesh term because it won't automatically map. Right. And, right. That, and then that goes down that whole lane of you have to check the search details in MeSH to see if it mapped or it didn't map and what it's mapping to and how it's breaking it apart. And it, it gets to the point where it's like, I, in my opinion, too much information. You know, so I think we keep it more higher level. And at that higher level, that's applicable to many other biblical data, bibliographic databases 
map as well, because most bibliographic databases don't automatic term map. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I do with the, my dots and circles is I point out to them that this works in any database that uses subject headings. And so if they know it for PubMed, they can do it for CINAHL, they could do it for Web of Science, et cetera, because what they've learned is the structure. And then after that, depending on what the session is, we'll go to Scopus and give examples of, okay, so this one works differently and this is why. Great, I wanna thank every one of our panelists today. That was the last question I had in the chat. So I'm gonna turn it back over to John here. All right, so um, I wanna give a big shout out and thanks to our presenters and sh thanks to sh um, Shannon and Elois from ACRL. Uh, again, we'll send a link out to the recording once it's available. Um, presenters, if you'll again, um, send your slides to Shannon uh, Johnson, your handouts. I've given her email in the chat box. Um, and again, thank you all for coming. Um, we really appreciate it and have a great um, weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.